Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me today. It's Alan Barry Labacan with the Rocks and Stocks News website. Um, we've got another in our interviews with uh, mining company executives. Today we have Joey Fries. She runs um, Candente Copper. And I'm very bullish on copper, um, you know, for many reasons, uh, mainly the, uh, the electrification of vehicles, uh, big and small. Um, but the other key reason I, I really like Candente and, and their copper story is I've seen these kind of markets before. Um, and usually what precedes a bullish market for these copper stories is consolidation. Uh, Candente has a top 10 asset in both size and grade. And those are exactly what major mining companies are looking to develop. So on that note, Joey, thank you very much for joining us. And thank you for inviting me. You've been around the block a few years, uh, Joey. Um, are you are you kind of seeing over here coming in? <laughs> <laughs> are you are you seeing a similar situation like um i remember in the early 2000s when it took a while for copper to really take off but um then it uh, it blasted off and there was a little, and i think it was preceded by some consolidation are you are you feeling the same thing absolutely yeah and there's never been a copper market in my lifetime um 60 some odd years <laughs> that is is quite like it is now i mean there, we have boom and bust obviously and we have our cycles but um you know things are really i don't know what you call it, the stars are aligning but it, it's a it's a it's an explosion of need for copper you know when you add all the development i mean i love to remind people copper's the, been the most useful metal on this earth for ten thousand years for me copper's life gold is money copper's life and why? Because you need it in every refrigerator, you need it in every telephone, you need it in every um, computer, you know, computers, you know, so even for your more simple lives, it's very, very needed, necessary, but now it's just becoming so required. And all the EV vehicles, they use four times as amount of copper as an, a usual vehicle, combustion engines. Um, the charging stations use a lot of copper and solar energy uses copper, so on it goes. Um, and, you know, these, these projects aren't that easy to find. I mean, copper isn't that easy to find. The easy stuff got found a long time ago. And um, so it's, it's more difficult to find. It's more difficult to convince people they want to mine in their backyard or to, you know, there's a lot of modern mining methods where I think we're very proud of and we've been implementing in our new PEA. But in any event, it takes a long time to bring, bring a copper, copper project into production. So, yeah, it's... It's an it's a phenomenal time to be developing a copper project. And you know, if I always try to envision myself as running a major mining company when I'm looking at companies, and over my career, I've had a pretty good success rate with picking companies that get taken over or joint venture into a uh, into a mining company. And I think both of those outcomes. I, I've talked about. Candente as a takeover target, but I think there's also the potential for a joint venture type relationship with a major that would put up the funding. And looking at why I look at it like that as I, I look at, well, what does a major mining company want to develop? Top 10 grade, top 10 uh, size, uh, it definitely fits that bill. Absolutely, you're, you're very correct. And, um, uh, do you, uh, how are things going as you get the story out there about your top 10 go size and top 10 grade and, you know, you're trading at a fraction of a penny when most of these things get taken out for one to three pennies. So um, you're a huge bargain in the copper space. Yes, um, by 43 101 rules, I'm best not say this, but I'll quote somebody else just, you know, referred to our project as 15 billion pounds copper equivalent. Um, you know, you know, we have copper, gold, silver, and, and now some Molly and, and Kenyak with sewer. But in any case, that's that's a huge resource and very economic under the the study of the latest PEA done by Asenko out in uh, February with the report in March. Um, so, no, it's it's an amazing project. and. Why is it so undervalued? Well, I won't go there at the moment, but th things are starting to pick up. I mean, 
Now, remember, we bought this copper project in 2001 when we had first gone public and we were actually looking for gold and silver um, in Peru. And this, this project, Candy Reaco, came available for 70, well, it was available for, for an auction. And copper was at 80 cents, between 60 and 80 cents a pound. Some big majors had just drilled some holes in, in, the, in about five years prior and saw that there's a deposit there, but low grade for 80 cent copper. Well, we picked it up for $75,000, waited until 2003, we were able to raise money, started drilling 2004 and our, our first, you know, I think 12 holes was 75 million tons and on it went from there. Every, I'm not going to say every drill hole didn't have copper, but we just kept expanding the resource from there on and on and on up to what we have today, which is um, measured and indicated and add in there inferred 14 billion pounds of copper and 2 million ounces silver, sorry, gold, gold and 90 million ounces of silver if you add in the inferred and, and, and that from Candiaco Sewer, you actually get up to 4 million ounces of gold. So anyway, it's a phenomenal resource. And um, by by world standards today, it's it's a very decent grade. Very good. Getting back to the comment about your preliminary economic assessment, Joey. Um, uh, talk to us about the price sensitivity because um, I think that's important as well. You are using a value of copper at much less than what it's currently trading at, and so. A lot of this above four bucks is and five bucks is uh, is gravy. Yeah, and and we like to be a little bit conservative in that we want to know the lowest price of copper it, it works at, and that's what we did back in 2011, 2012. We used 250 copper. Now we use 350 copper, and the reason we like that and thought that was pretty good is because um, the capex is just over a billion dollars and the NPV using an 8% discount is also just over a billion dollars. So when you can get your capex and your NPV to be equal to each other and you're still using a, you know, what's a safe pr price or conservative price of copper, good long-term price of copper, 350, then that's great. Now, having said that, you move up to $4 copper and the NPV at, still at 8% discount goes to 1.4. And then by 450 copper, which we've backed off from recently, but I'm sure we'll be back at soon, is 1.8 billion. And that those are all post-tax. So that's those are fantastic numbers. Yeah, and uh, you know, I've been making the com comments for a while that I think we're gonna see north of five dollars and that could become the new normal. Um, you know, it, the day doesn't go by. I just read the other day that BMW or I mean Mercedes Benz was talking about supply constraints. They can't can't get enough supplies to meet the demand for electric vehicles. And I think that's indicative of an industry-wide situation with car makers. Oh, just go to a go to your favorite car dealer and try and buy an EV vehicle. I mean, I've been trying at mine and and you know I can only get an SUV. Well I don't want to drive an SUV. I don't need an SUV. <laughs> that's all you could get. Anyway. Yeah. And they're all, they're all just, uh, they, they're consuming everything they can to build them as fast as they can. And I think we're still in the early days. So, you know, this looks to me like a 10 or 20 year window of strong demand. And what's the most important uh, metal for electrification of anything? Yeah, you need a lot of it. You, know? you need a lot of copper. And now they're talking about buses and semi trucks and, you know, if they can't get enough copper and other m minerals for the vi electric vehicle, imagine when they start consuming copper and other minerals for uh, semi trucks and uh, buses to move people around. Yeah. And then there's all the development that needs to happen in the world redevelopment, you know, with the construction and wiring. So plumbing and wiring, you know, it's the most conductive metal there is, both with elect for electricity and for heat. So needed and everything every literally everything i mean just look at my desk here the i only have a few things on it but all of them need copper right yeah you know and then you look around your house and you look at your computer your refrigerator your stove everything uh needs a, and that's not even looking outside your house if you're lucky enough to be able to buy an electric vehicle that's right yeah so um 
some of the news you had out recently, Joey, uh, let's talk about some of that. Why don't you uh, highlight what you think is the most important on a couple of your last news releases? Sure. Well, we're, we're moving into feasibility on Canuaco Norte and then applying for drilling permits for exploration on Canuaco Sur and Quebrada Verde, both um, you know parallel tracks because there's different authorities that approve the EIA and the permits for those. So we're um, just assembling the team um, that's going to be doing all the various aspects of the engineering. We'll probably do some trade-off studies because we need to have another look at the geotech, a um, little bit of detail on the resource, and um, a few other things that came up with the new strategy. We can get those going sooner, and then um, the full feasibility, once the, the, once the um, trade-off studies are done, will be in another about six months. Then there's the EIA, um, and I call it, it's now, e, you know, ESID, because Environmental Social Impact Assessment. That gets done with different authorities in Peru than your average drilling permits. And one way to do it is to do it, um, so you do it alongside Sanase so that they know what you're doing at every step. So that by the time it's finished, they know all about it. It's not like you've spent a year or two assembling data and then hand them a huge report and they take forever to go through it. Um, but one way to do it is to include uh, about 20 of the main permits you need, and that takes about a little longer, so that'd be a year and a half. But that's okay, those are the permits you need for construction. So, um, so we're working on assembling the team to do that. And then uh, some more MET testing for feasibility is the next thing that we've already got the core ready to go, so that won't take long. And then, um, of course, financing all of this, we were offered a financing from Lind Partners, which we thought was very good, and we announced that. Um, and then following that, we've received other offers. So now we're in discussions with various groups to see if we do a combination financing that includes several groups, or if we just choose one of these, one of the alternatives sitting in front of us. And in the meantime, just to make sure we don't lose our momentum on our feasibility and, and the EIA and work, um, we're, we've um, ta been uh, we're negotiated and uh, received a, a million dollar bridge loan, so that we're not you know sitting around and wasting time developing the project. So we were very happy to be able to do that. So you're in a good cash position. It looks like that'll get better to keep things rolling on ticking off all the boxes towards development. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also increased your land position. Uh, oh, yeah. I found that quite interesting. Um, yeah, that came as a result of, of Fortescue having staked. They really like exploration, and they've been very aggressive with their exploration in Peru. And then they got involved with us in the investment um, so that they could you know, have a piece of a company that has a more advanced project. And then in the meantime, they staked um, quite a few claims in the area of Canyon Riaco that they thought were very prospective and we had an area of interest clause so um, they basically you know if we'd gone into a joint venture they would have just been thrown into the joint venture but since we haven't then um, they were required to turn to um, tra transfer the title of those that land so that's been great you know we're really glad they picked it up when they did and that others didn't and that you know we've got a very good relationship with them so it's good to have it in our land package. And are there some geological similarities between Sur and Norte and, and this new ground? Um, we don't know yet. We haven't done a lot of exploration. We know there's some gold targets out there, but we haven't identified um, porphyry targets yet. But it's there's no, you know, that would be something we'll be working on. Do you have any idea why Fortescue chose that land? Can't just because it's uh, close to Canariaco. Could be, could be because many majors have staked around us in the past. Okay. And many majors are still around us. Some Fresno has some ground. Sumitomo has ground. Um, uh, Valley out of Brazil has some ground. So I mean, if you, it's a porphyry belt, so people, you know, it's a good time. They just. Some of them don't hang on to it very long if they don't, if they get busy elsewhere because it is expensive land to hang on, you know, it's expensive period holding on to mineral rights in Peru if you don't work them. Right. And uh, man, that's a lot of big companies. You just, all the copper majors yeah. are in and around you and invested in you. Correct. Combination thereof. Yeah. 
Yeah, Fortescue is a big shareholder, right? Yes, 19.9%. Right, and... and uh, some extra rights with that. They have a, um, a member on our board. They have the right to always stay at the 19.9 by participating in all equity financings at the same terms that anybody else is given. And um, they have a right of first refusal that will run out before the end of this month that was on is on all debt, uh, royalty, or streaming. So any kind of non-equity financing, they had a right of first refusal on that. And that's still in place um, for another couple of weeks. Till the end of May? Yeah, I think it's actually May 21st or 22nd, yeah. That could uh, change the outlook quite dramatically, open up options for you guys. Yeah, um, yeah correct. Okay, and uh, so far um, they've been participating to keep their interest at 19.9 all the way? Yes, they have, yeah. They've been very supportive and don't want to um, back off on any of their interest. In fact, you know, we, we've had some discussions they could go higher. But and uh, is that including in these current ones you're working on, the million and the possibility of the other ones? Yes, every time we rate, we rate, get serious um, offers from other third parties, we'll call it, then we always discuss it with Fortescue and see what they might like to do as well, yes. Excellent. So um, looking forward a little bit, Joey, what are the what are the highlights of the milestones you see coming up? I think you touched on some already, but let's yeah. wrap it up for people. Sure. So of course, closing a financing, a significant financing, so that we can do all this um, work on feasibility. We wouldn't be raising the money for drilling at Canyon Aquasur and Verde yet, because we'll, we'll wait till we have those permits. Um, but we need between um, five and 10 million to complete all the things we want to do with feasibility, EIA and such over the next two years. Um, and then it, I'd like to break down the feasibility itself because some people think it's a big black box that, okay, they did a PEA, that, the results are out from that and everybody knows it's over 200 pages and it's not a black box. There's a ton and ton and ton of work in there. But as you know, we've done work, engineering work on the project in the past. We've just changed things with the PEA as far as starting smaller, ramping up, you know, um, nice, nice size after payback, which at 350 copper, seven years, but at 450 copper, it's only four years. Um, and then all the air so what we need to look at is all the other studies we did what is what is it we've already completed that's at pre-feasibility level and what is it we were doing that was already in the feasibility because we had started a feasibility now i can't call it in this moment a feasibility level completion study because we never completed feasibility but having said that we've got an, a ton of work very serious engineering work that will go into the feasibility and we need to understand exactly what was done and how it pertains to the, the new mine plan or the new strategy for developing the mine, a mine, and, um, and not. And as I said, that some of that is the trade-off study. So, you know, how, how, is the new plant site the best um, conveyor system that's been now imp decided to be implemented instead of lot, lots of trucking? Um, just have a better look at that take a better look at the resource. There's about $50,000 allocated to just finishing off the resource on Norte. So the modeling is all done, you know, to the highest level possible. Geotech, um, we could need a few more holes for the ultimate pit at Canaraco Norte. So, um, you know, we'll have a further study on the geotech. Again, maybe $50,000, a little less, just to make sure we know exactly what we're doing on the pit area for Norte. Now, you also need to look at geotech for sewer and for um, where the commingling facility is for the waste and the tailings. Um, and then the MET, MET testing, the great thing is uh, we, we did pre-fees level testing. We were all ready to do um, feasibility level testing. We drilled all that core. That core is in cold storage in Kamloops. So we have a proposal already to do the feasibility level MET testing and um, we're just reviewing that and deciding exactly you know who should do it and such but that can get started you know fairly fairly soon or at least as soon as we're well financed for the full fees and that won't take that long so then that, that's a really key thing is your met testing that tells you a lot about 
secure deposit and that's a very a high level it adds a lot of level of confidence to you know how you're processing and, and what your con will look like so so you know sometimes i see companies that are putting out resource calculations and stuff like this and it gets lost on the market has a way of revaluing them less uh, the work you're doing now is much different kind of studies, that feasibility and also getting all your permits and your community relationships all together. These are much more important to anybody that would be looking at a joint venture or a takeover of Candente. Yeah, anybody that wants to build a mine at Caniriaco, these are really key, key points for them, key information. So you got a lot of milestones ahead of you and you're sort of ticking off the boxes of what a major or a developer would want to know about Ken, uh, Kenny Riaco. Correct, yeah. Also the groups that do off-take agreements, um, you know, the Glencores of the world, Trafigura, that sort of thing. And, um, and then, then there's Peruvian pension funds that could get involved in project finance as well and need, need to do more de-risking, which is what we're doing now. And um, Joey, have you ever done any of those uh, evaluations of how you compare uh, to your peers that let's say are in the top 10 um, of the you know, grade and size and where you fit in that, in that category? I know where it is, but maybe, if you've done some of that analysis, maybe you can uh, highlight it. We don't do it ourselves, but we're very happy that because it needs to be impartial. And there is a lot of work going in that goes into it because no deposit, just because you have a cop, you know, a pound of copper, it's not the same pound of copper, depending upon where it is and what the impurities are and all that kind of stuff. But both um, RFC Ambrian and Haywood did reports in December. And both of them show that we're in the top 10 of whichever, you know, for Ambrian, it was 23 projects. For Haywood, it was, um, I forget how many they used. Um, but so we're in the top 10 of. So were those undeveloped? Undeveloped at large, large, late stage copper resources that are undeveloped, yeah. So PEA and above kind of things and. and I would think, yeah. 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 And where did you guys, you guys fit well into the top 10 on the grade in the, uh, in the uh, but for investors, they want to know where you fit in the valuation, because I'm a big bargain hunter. And uh, I think a lot of people out there can, can see you guys as a bargain hunter, uh, if you have some statistics on that. Yeah, it's, so Ambrian shows, and that's in our PowerPoint on our website, 10th largest and fifth highest in copper grade. Now, those reports by Haywood and by um, RFC and Brand, if you get the whole report from those groups, those will show you some other valuations. And uh, it's fair to say you're in the bottom 10% probably of valuations. I mean, a lot of juniors are, have very bad valuations right now, but you're right. We're, we're, it's not hard to see how well, how, how well undervalued we are, if, those, if you can say it like that. Yeah. Well, that's a great note to, to close on, Joey. Did you have anything else you wanted to mention? No, I think we, we got man, managed to get through everything. I was thinking, yeah, that's great. Excellent. So I'm going to close things off and we can have a chat at the other end. Okay, sounds good. All right, folks. So there you go. Um, th this is a, uh, Candente has a very exciting project on the copper space. I'm very bullish on copper. I don't think I'm alone, but the valuations make me feel like I'm alone. And when I've felt that before, um, it's usually at the early stages of when a bull market starts for that metal. And usually what um, precedes that is consolidation in the industry. And as Joey and I have talked about, they have a top 10 asset in size, top five in grade of undeveloped projects that are advanced. And yet they are in the lower percentile of those that um, on the valuation to what they have in the ground. Uh, I think that that makes them a good candidate for a takeover uh, by a bigger company or 
Uh, another um, uh, outcome could be a joint venture uh, where the uh, big companies come in and develop the mine and uh, Candente can keep a chunk of it. Either way, I'm a bargain hunter uh, and I like to find assets when they're cheap. And uh, I think we're at the cusp of a much more bullish market for copper stocks. And uh, I think Candente is one you want to take a look at. On that note, it's important for you to do your homework, speak with your financial advisors before making any investment decisions. I'm a big proponent of investors understanding what they're investing in. So do your homework, go to their website, look at that PowerPoint presentation. You're gonna see some of the statistics that we talked about that presents the story uh, quite nicely by uh, independent researchers. Um, so do that homework and uh, check out Candente because I think they've got a bright future ahead of them and I think they've got a mine in the making. So have a great day and we will talk to you soon.